Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in our fiscal year 2019 webinar series titled SOAR, a reentry tool for individuals involved in the criminal justice system. The SOAR TA Center is pleased to bring you today's webinar in partnership with the SAMHSA's Gain Center. My name is Pam Hine, Senior Project Associate with the SOAR TA Center, and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items to review. A disclaimer. This training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Human Services. The contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA or DHHS. The training should not be considered substitute for individualized care and treatment decisions. Just a few webinar instructions. As a reminder, your lines will be muted throughout the entire webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for download on the SOAR website in about a week or so. You may download the presentation slides or other materials now by going to the top left of your screen and clicking File, Save, Document, or visit the SOAR website at soarworks.prainc.com. Click Webinars on the left sidebar and choose today's topic. At the, at the conclusion of the webinar, you will immediately be redirected to a brief evaluation, which we kindly ask you to complete. And finally, we will save all questions and comments until the end of the presentation, at which time we will review instructions for posing questions to panelists via the Q&A function. A few learning objectives. It is our intention that by the end of this webinar, you will learn about key strategies and best practices for introducing SOAR and engaging your criminal justice uh, community. Today's agenda. So to reach those objectives, we will begin this afternoon with presentations from Dazra Ware, who is a Senior Project Associate with the SOAR TA Center, and Dan Abreu, who is a Senior Project Associate with the GAIN Center, both here at Policy Research Associates. They have collaborated extensively over the years with establishing SOAR initiatives within criminal justice systems around the country. You'll then hear from Paul Malloy, who is the Director of Programs with the National Sheriff's Office in Nashville, Tennessee, and Lolita Johnson, the lead SOAR counselor with the Davidson County Sheriff's, Sheriff's Office in Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. They will share how they have implemented SOAR within their jail system. Next up, providing a SOAR prison implementation perspective for the state of Oklahoma are Donna Bond, who is the coordinator of mental health reentry with the Oklahoma Department of Corrections in Oklahoma City, and Marcus Ayers, the manager of prison-based reentry services, also in Oklahoma City with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health Services. And finally, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, which are facilitated by the SAMHSA uh, SOAR TA Center staff. So providing today's welcome, we have Robert Grace, who is our um, Project Officer uh, at SAMHSA. Bobby, please provide your welcome. Yes, hi, thanks. I'd like to start by, again, thanking all of you for joining us today. I'm Bobby Grace, and on behalf of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, and the Homeless Programs Branch of the Center for Mental Health Services, I would like to welcome you to this joint webinar with SAMHSA's SOAR TA Center and SAMHSA's GAINS Center for Behavior Health and Justice Transformation. This webinar is titled SOAR, a reentry tool for individuals involved in the criminal justice system. SOAR, which stands for SSISSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery, helps states and communities increase access to Social Security disability benefits for eligible adults who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness and have a serious mental illness, medical impairment, and or co-occurring substance use disorder. Today's web webinar will feature speakers who will share their best practices for implementing SOAR in a county jail, state correctional system, and explore how SOAR implementation in criminal justice settings can be a strong reentry tool to increasing housing stability and promote post-release success. And now, I would like to turn things back over to Pam Hine, who will be moderating today's webinar. Pam? 
Thank you, Bobby. So now I will turn it over to Desiree Ware, Ware who will kick things off. Desiree, please begin your presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Pam, for that introduction, and thanks to the guests attending today and taking the time to participate in this webinar. We are super excited to have you here. As mentioned, this webinar is entitled a SOAR, a tool for, to reentry for individuals involved in the criminal justice system. It's intended to explore the intersection of criminal justice and behavioral health and how the SOAR model can be used in effort to address the challenges associated with reentry and recovery for individuals involved in the criminal justice system with uh, serious mental illness, physical disabilities, and or co-occurring substance use disorders. Our presenters will share their work and their experience with SOAR implementation in both jails and prison settings, but first let's cover some basics. So what is SOAR? So for those guests that have experience with assisting others with disability applications, please bear with me as I quickly review some of the key points for, uh, uh, so, um, for others that may not be as familiar. To start, SOAR stands for, as Bobby, um, Robert Grace mentioned, uh, SOAR stands for SSI, SSDI Outreach Access and Recovery, and it's a model that's sponsored by SAMHSA uh, in collaboration with the Social Security Administration. It's developed to, de to assist eligible individuals apply for the two disability programs that are administered by the Social Security Administration, uh, SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income, and SSDI, um, which is Social Security Disability Insurance. This model was specifically designed to help states increase this access to these benefit programs for eligible adults who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness and have a serious mental illness uh, or other disabling condition. Yes, it's in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. However, it's important to note that although SOAR presence is marked nationwide, there are many communities within each state that may not have uh, SOAR providers. Well, just yet. The SOAR TA Center is working really hard to expand SOAR to the point where every community everywhere will gain access to SOAR providers in the future. So uh, I mentioned the two disability programs, SSI and SSCI, so let's take a, a closer look. So each program um, has uh, the same criteria for determining disability based on medical evidence and functional abilities. Both programs utilize the same application process, and although they have different application forms, they share one disability determination. Each program has an associated health insurance program. So on the left is the su Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. Uh, this is a needs-based program for individuals who are blind, disabled, or elderly with low income or resources. The federal benefit rate for this program is $750, which is a, a way of saying that's the maximum amount awarded with federal dollars it's approved. And um, this program is accompanied by Medicaid in most states. And again, this is a needs-based program, so resources are um, really heavily investigated and, and looked at. And in short, if the, application, if the applicant has resources, and there is no need, um, they won't be eligible for that program. But on the other hand, or should I say on the, other, on the right side of the slide, is the Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI, also for blind or disabled individuals. Um, but these individuals are insured through their contributions to the Social Security Trust Fund. So based on their work, um, the amount of money they contributed into that trust fund while working will yield the award amount uh, if that person became disabled. And in most states, Medicare is associated and generally provided under this program. Um, again, these are both disability programs that require an applicant to meet um, SSA's definition of disability, defined as the inability to engage in substantial gainful activity or work um, with a monetary amount that looks like um, earnings of $1,180 a month as of 2018 that have a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that is lasted or has, is expected to last a continuous period of 12 months or more or result in death. 
in addition to the defi- uh, to that definition, I think it's really important to point out um, that there's a myth that's often heard with people um, that work with individuals in criminal justice settings that have been circulating around the country for years and years, um, and that is that if a person is incarcerated, they're automatically eligible for disability, and that's simply not true. Um, incarceration is viewed as a living situation and not a disabling condition. However, um, People that are incarcerated with serious mental illness experience functional uh, limitations that kind of prohibit them from working um, at that level long before they become incarcerated. And in fact, for many individuals, um, interaction with police can be linked to the symptoms associated with their diagnosis that is tied to the behavior that ultimately led to arrest and further involvement in criminal justice systems in the first place. So that's why we're doing this work. Um, But what happens, to benefits when people or someone becomes incarcerated? Um, Well, that depends on a couple of things. Time, how long they've been incarcerated, and also it depends on what benefit program they were awarded. So if someone was receiving supplemental security income, uh, for individuals that receive this benefit, there's no effect on their benefit if they were incarcerated for less than a calendar month. However, benefits are suspended if the person is incarcerated for one to 12 calendar months and terminated when they're incarcerated for 12 months or more. Be mindful that these are calendar months and which is different than 30 days. For example, if someone became incarcerated today, October 24th, and released on November 27th, that person has been incarcerated for more than 30 days, but not the full calendar month of October or November and there should be no effect on their benefit check. When benefits are terminated, however, they must reapply with a new application. When receiving uh, Social Security Disability Insurance, um, those recipients are eligible to continue receiving their benefits until they are convicted and confined for more than 30 continuous days. Once released, um, the individual can uh, have benefits reinstated at the Social Security office, they must, um, you know, arrive at the office with discharge papers to show legitimate release. Um, so as we continue to speak about the SOAR model, it's really important to have those basic rules in mind. It will help you plan the course of action for discharge planners and entry specialists and others that prepare for an individual to be released. So. So now that we've covered some of the basics, it's very with a very, very, very broad stroke. Um, we will review what makes SOAR so unique. Um, so um, we have our super SOAR there, um, and says that SOAR trained caseworkers are the heroes, and that is um, definitely the case. And each of these components is expanded upon during our online course, course and, and through training. But in general, the SOAR model encourages a collaborative process and facilitates communications among the applicants, the case managers, Social Security, disability determination services, community providers. It it provides case managers um, with the tools they need to assume a really central role in gathering complete, targeted, and relevant information for Social Security uh, and, um, and DDS. SOAR operates um, on the use of some critical components, which is depicted in this slide, one of which include um, acting as authorized representative, which is uh, really key to allowing for two-way communication between um, the Social Security Office, um, Disability Determinations, and and the uh, SOAR case manager. Collecting medical records, you know, writing a medical summary report, encouraging collaboration with treatment sources to have that MSR signed, um, completing a quality review to ensure that the information submitted is complete and concise and stands up to the facility of the SOAR model. All of these things help uh, the disability determination process move more um, smoothly and quickly by providing the assistance to Social Security and DDS that's needed. Um, another u- unique feature is that SOAR seeks approval on the initial applications, avoiding the need for appeals. Um, and you know, and we we 
tend to go kind of above and beyond by working to increase access to supportive services and employment opportunities. There's tons of support that are available for SOAR providers, state and local leads kind of spearhead and coordinate the implementation of the SOAR initiative. And these local leaders identify and engage stakeholders to participate in steering committees um, that kind of meet regularly to collaborate, report on progress, troubleshoot any challenges, and basically provide that continued support to SOAR case managers with supplemental trainings and online course support. The SOAR um, case managers are the kind of, they're the crown jewel of the structure and um, work hard to provide the highest quality applications in order to yield the best results for not only um, the individual but um, to demonstrate their work and their efforts. All these are key players and very valuable partners in the SOAR initiative all united to end homelessness and increase post-release success for individuals with disabling conditions. And there's more support. The, SOAR, the SAMHSA SOAR TA Center will be with you every step of the way. Our website holds our contact information for each of our liaisons uh, that are assigned to each state. We um, encourage strongly contact and communication with us. Um, through our website, you will gain access to all the tools and resources that you need to support you, including um, those supplemental training tools and uh, the online course access. Through continued support and collaboration with state and local leads, SOAR providers across the country continue to, um, well, they continue to SOAR. These are our national outcomes for 2018. Cumulatively, 50 states and Washington, D.C. have reported using the SOAR model to assist over um, 71,705 people who are experiencing a risk of homelessness with um, disability applications. Um, again, this is the annual report for last fiscal year covering the date ranges of July 1st, 2017 to June 30th of 2018. There is a 65% approval rate on initial applications um, at 100 days to decision with approximately 4,300 approvals. Um, that's a lot of lives that have changed. These outcomes um, can be compared to the national average of 29% for all people applying without assistance. Specific to um, our criminal justice outcomes, um, this report was generated uh, as of August 1st, 2018. Um, it demonstrates or depicts SOAR assisted applications that have been completed for people that are living in correctional facilities. So as you can see, it's a 76% 70, approval rate in an uh, average range of 79 days. Um, and although these outcomes are strong, our goal is to see more people that are currently involved in criminal justice systems have access to SOAR services because we are confident that the access to these benefits um, will really help promote post-release success. The possibilities kind of speak loudly and clearly. Um, so SSI and SSDI, I've said it about four times already, promotes post-release success. The income um, attached to this benefit program really reduces state costs in a way that we might not consider. Um, the insurance um, that is available um, creates healthier individuals that are more likely to participate in treatment and thereby creating healthier communities. But I want to emphasize the income portion because of its connection with housing, making it a strong factor in post-release success and promoting the participation in treatment. It's really hard to think about treatment when your basic needs are not met due to having no income and no idea where you're gonna lay your head at night. The use of SOAR to secure funding to, can, that can promote funding, op, uh, housing opportunities and housing stability that's so desperately needed upon post-release increases the treatment participation and decreases the utilization of hospitals and emergency rooms for care. Collaboration is the cornerstone for source success. 
partnering with medical records providers, community mental health providers, sheltering agencies, housing partners, hospitals, court systems, probation, parole, on and on. Why? Because partnerships and collaborations are critical to any reentry program success. We share the same clientele and often provide the same services to the exact same person. Avoiding these missed opportunities to share information can save valuable time and resources and promote a true recovery model for a person, for the people that we serve. Working together to strategize ways to share information and organize our effort to assist this individual with the tools they need upon release in order to reduce their likelihood of returning into the criminal justice system. Here are some facilities um, well on their way to source success. So since 2017, 12 agencies have responded to the call and are working to implement SOAR within their programs, in their criminal justice programs. They've applied for and received a technical assistance award, which will be discussed a little later um, in this um, webinar. Um, to strategize a plan for SOAR implementation in their facilities. They understood the urgency to connect with the people they serve, with the resources that they needed to promote successful community integration. They worked really hard through the delays in the implementation due to staff changes, leadership changes, limited resources, workload demands, and are using the outcomes as leverage to funding conversations because the data can no longer be overlooked. The challenges faced with by reentry planners, case managers, court systems, and all those other you know, partners that are responsible for assisting individuals comply with the conditions of release while still looking for resources to meet basic needs such as housing and treatment is exceptionally challenging when the individual has no income and no support and is unlikely to maintain employment due to disabling conditions. So where do we start? First, start off by believing that recovery is possible and approaching SOAR implementation from the solutions-based perspective. Um, benefits acquisitions may not solve every single issue, but it's a start to alleviate some of them. Then consider a pilot, stick with the plan, and give yourself time to see the results. Um, identify the need, uh, create a proposal by discussing prevalent, um, the prevalence of mental health needs within, your, within one facility or unit or pod, mainly focusing on those um, units that may house people with uh, the most serious conditions. Um, do some research, calculate how much it costs to house those folks with serious mental illness in your, in your agency and compare it to the reduction of the cost if that person was in the community uh, at the earliest possible time. Then provide that information to the decision makers and authorities within your, in your agency to emphasize source success and um, highlight that success that has been demonstrated around the country. Work with your SOAR TA center. Um, your liaison and helped, um, we can help with the communication with Social Security and DDS and encourage those post-release, uh, those pre-release agreements and, um, you know, uh, facilitate communication and collaboration so that there could be a true initiative. Um, give yourself some time, uh, train, time to train, time to do. This is not like a fill the form out and forget it kind of approach. It's very hands-on. Um, time, give yourself time to see results. One year to see some results, two years to see a fully functioning program, and track your outcomes. Um, test the plan Create a, by creating a pilot site. Pilot sites provide a great opportunity to test your plan and um, in a focused kind of area. Address those challenges, make those revisions, use those outcomes and results as leverage um, to continue talking to folks. Breathe, celebrate your success, learn from your mistakes, and repeat. This is a totally uh, replicable program that we hope to expand. So in conclusion of my portion of this presentation, um, I know that we say that SOAR is SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. But for the purposes of this webinar, to, webinar today, I encourage you to think of SOAR as SSI, 
SSDI opportunity to access resources to recovery. Thank you. And now I'll pass this presentation on to my colleague, uh, Dan Abreu. Uh, Dan is a seasoned criminal justice professional and a current senior project associate with the SAMHSA Gain Center in Del Mar, New York. Dan? Thank you, Des. Um, so is, is that Des provided an overview uh, that SOAR really is uniquely suited to address a lot of the issues that, prevent, that are presented to the justice-involved population. Um, and my, I'm going to pick up from there and talk specifically about, to give you an overview of, of some of the um, characteristics, characteristics of justice-involved people with mental illness in the justice system. As a group, justice-involved persons, excuse me while I, <clears throat> there we go. As a group, justice-involved persons are disadvantaged in many ways that result in a higher prevalence of mental illness in the justice system, but also, and not surprisingly, that result in inability to access health care and recovery support on exiting the justice system. And SOAR can be a critical component to balance those inequities. If you look at the graphic on the left side of your screen, there are almost 2 million individuals incarcerated in the nation's jails and prisons. And for those of you who might not know, the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world. There are an additional 4 million people under probation or parole supervision. Now looking at the graphic on the right side of the screen, jails incarcerate pre-trial individuals and individuals sentenced to one year or less, and prisons incarcerate individuals in over one year. On any given day, there are twice the number of individuals incarcerated in prisons and jails. However, and this is a staggering number, there are almost 12 million people admitted yearly into jails, and often for lengths of stay of less than 30 days, which for a person with mental illness is just long enough to disrupt access to healthcare benefits, housing, employment, and other social supports. And this study from BJA demonstrates the healthcare needs of justice-involved individuals, which is significant. What they found is that there is increased prevalence of high blood pressure and diabetes, three times the prevalence of heart-related illness, four and a half times the prevalence of infectious disease, including hepatitis, HIV, and TB, 10 times the prevalence of hepatitis, over six times the pre prevalence of tuberculosis and three and a half times the prevalence of HIV. In looking at mental health prevalence, the prevalence rate in the general population of serious mental illness hovers around 4%. But in the justice system, the rates of serious mental illness in jails is four and a half four times higher than the general population. And 75% of those people uh, in jails with serious mental illness have a co-occurring disorder. Further challenging providing care to this population is the prevalence of trauma. This data is derived from individuals with mental illness who participate in one of 17 SAMHSA-funded jail diver diversion programs. The trauma rates are, uh, and as you see here um, on the left, women um, identified a 96% lifetime prevalence rate, and men, 89% uh, lifetime prevalence rate of trauma. The prevalence rates for incarcerated justice-involved individuals uh, is the same for both genders. What surprised us a little when we looked more closely at the data is the amount of current prevalence that was identified by people going, 
going through the, those jail diversion programs. And current trauma being identified as having had a traumatic episode the year prior to the arrest that brought them into the program. 74% of the women, 86% of the men, uh, reported a, trauma, a traumatic incident the year prior to, to, to their arrest. What that means in terms of people being released from jails and, and prisons is that very often the first thing you're dealing with is not so much their treatment needs as, as it is safety needs. People are in safe, unsafe relationships and living in unsafe environments. Parenthetically, you should know that uh, the rates for veterans, the trauma rates for veterans in another jail diversion program that focused on veterans were about the same as, as we see here. Um, there's a myth, I think, that uh, the trauma Trauma for veterans is solely related to combat, not when you're talking about justice-involved veterans. The veterans that went through these jail diversion programs, less than 50 percent percent ever ever uh, participated in any combat. But what? But the data did show that 73 percent of the veterans participating in the diversion programs had 73% had pre-military trauma. So again, addressing uh, for the purposes of SOAR and for treatment planning, documenting trauma is critical for, for these individuals. <clears throat> so other studies show that people with serious mental illnesses are more likely to be homeless, more likely to have co-occurring disorders, use a greater variety of services at a higher cost, and they're more likely when they're in prison to have um, disciplinary problems. They're more likely to be unemployed and have extensive psychological impairment. And their uh, length of stay tends to be longer. Generally, that's due to inability to make bail, which is uh, further compromised by homelessness. Now, <clears throat> Because people with mental illness, uh, this slide will demonstrate that people with mental illness are more likely to be homeless and that homelessness affects outcomes in the justice system. You can see the legend on the right, street homeless in dark blue, shelter homeless, light blue, non-homeless in black, that at arraignment, um, street and shelter homeless are two to three times less likely to be released at their first court appearance and that um, they're uh, one and a half to three times more likely to complete their full sentence rather, rather than being, being released early. So homelessness compounds, uh, com compounds justice involvement. Now, in developing your programs, um, if you haven't worked, oh, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> so the, um, Again, some, some more information about the nature of, of jails uh, in developing your programs. Uh, nationally, about three quarters of the people being held in jails really haven't been convicted of anything. They're, they're there in pretrial status, often because they're poor and they can't make bail, and of course, in the case of people with mental illness, because uh, there, there's a prejudice toward keeping uh, people, people in jail longer. Um, when we look at New York City data, this data from New York City, you'll also find, that, and this, this holds true across communities, that there is a, a group of high utilizers. Uh, just as we have high utilizers in the healthcare system, there are, in the shelter systems, there are high utilizers in the jail system cycling uh, around shelters, jails, and, and emergency rooms. And this, re this review of Rikers Island shows similar, similar patterns. So they've identified 473 people over a five-year period who had been admitted to the jail over 18 times, mainly charged with low-level low charges and, uh, and a significant percentage with mental illness. And that these 473 people accounted for over 10,000 jail admissions. So again, when you're thinking about um, implementing SOAR, this, uh, SOAR has had tremendous success working with homeless populations and high utilizer of services and people 
uh, participating in Housing First initiatives. And these are the, exactly the kinds of individuals that you'll encounter and could benefit from a robust SOAR initiative. Now, in, if you haven't worked in jails before, there's um, developing the relationships with the jail health care providers and the prison health care providers is important. But they're not the same across the country. Um, so there are some jails that employ their health care staff, meaning that they're employees of the Department of Corrections or in the prisons or the, or the sheriff's department in the jails. Um, there, are other, there are other communities that you'll find where the county mental health department and the county health department will come into the jail and provide those services. Uh, so there are other models where the jail will contract with a national correctional health care provider. These are, uh, these are providers that specialize in providing custodial treatment across the country and may not have any particular connection to the communities that they, that they are working in. Um, and then the, third, the fourth model would be where a jail contracts with a local provider uh, who might be a private or a public co contractor. Of these three models, probably the most challenging would be the national uh, correctional health care vendors that come in. Now, this isn't like what, like all generalizations, so, some are, are better than others, but generally the, the, these providers, the contract providers, will do what they get paid to do. And if there isn't a discharge planning piece to their contract, uh, their, their main focus and their mission is going to be on providing custodial care. And it will take a little bit more engagement and effort to enroll them and get them to participate and spend their time to participate in the SOAR initiative. So you should be aware of that. And that could occur in either jails or prisons. Again, demonstrating the importance of being able to access health care and, and the SOAR's role in this. This study comes out of the state of Washington where they followed uh, 30,000 individuals released from Washington state prisons. And what they found over, um, over a two-year period is that 443 died during that follow-up period, leading to a mortality rate three and a half times that of the general population. Within the first two weeks, the mortality rate was 13 times higher than the general population, with the primary cause of death being drug overdose, heart disease, homicide, and suicide. So again, I think this dramatizes the need to have access to care immediately upon release. Further uh, emphasizing this point, this, this slide depicts the risk of arrest as a function of time spent in the community. The data demonstrates that the highest risk of arrest is in the days and weeks immediately after release. So uh, you will note that those charged with drug crimes have the highest risk of, of arrest two to three times higher uh, the, in the immediate days after release. Um, again, highlighting the need for health services uh, upon, upon reentry. So, having Social Security benefits can address many of the inequities faced by the justice involved persons with mental illness, providing access to income, health care, and housing. In the work that uh, Des and I and the Source Center have done over the years, assisting jails, prisons, and community partners in development of SOAR programs, We've identified five areas that need to be addressed in, in program development. Uh, leadership, collaboration, resources, whether or not there are competing initiatives um, that, are, that will interfere with the implementation, and then training. And I'm not gonna go into these specifically now. Rather, as our next presenters uh, from Oklahoma and Tennessee are talking about their programs, consider these five areas and how uh, these, these programs address these very, various issues, and we can address these more specifically when we get to the question and answer part of the, of the presentation. So at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Paul Malloy, Director of Programs for the Nashville Sheriff's Office, and Lolita Johnson, Lead SOAR Counselor.
from the Davidson County Sheriff's Office. Okay. I, first, I want to thank the SAMSHA for allowing us to particip participate in this webinar uh, on the SOAR program. Um, as many of you know, this is a, a new initiative for us here in Nashville, and we hope to highlight some of the successes that we're having and then also some of the challenges we're, we're still working toward. Um, in 2014, the mayor's office asked Sheriff Hall if he could uh, plan, develop, and implement a SOAR program within the jail system, and Sheriff Hall agreed and designated two full-time staff persons uh, to establish the SOAR program in our facilities, which we have four facilities here. And after a thorough training through the SOAR process, we these two individuals are our assessors for all four of our facilities, um, along with the case managers training on referring those that would qualify for the SOAR program. Uh, we basically initiated in 2014, but probably didn't get started really well until about 2016. Um, this is a part of our reentry effort as part of the transition from jail to community initiative. We started back in 2009. We see SOAR as an extension of our reentry efforts. Uh, we provide all types of programming, uh, licensed alcohol and drug treatment, uh, battery intervention programming, education, and SOAR is a key component through the mental health piece. Um, it was just mentioned the collaboration of the healthcare inside the jail facilities. We've been fairly lucky here. We do have contract healthcare, and part of that contract provides for a mental health uh, agency that is also located in the community. So. The individuals providing the care in the jail facilities are also the ones that we are referring back out to the community, as well as others that also provide SOAR uh, access. This is a very innovative program on our end. Um, this is the initial part of a program that we have not participated in before. Uh, we see it's going really well along with the case managers and the SOAR counselors were able to screen uh, at least 350 or more people, see who is eligible, and apply those for benefits to the Social Security Administration. Um, Lolita Johnson, I'll turn this over to her. She can go through some of the mechanics of how we participate in SOAR make the referral, and then also apply the individual. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about some of the tracking data we've been looking at for the last few years. Uh, Lolita, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Paul. So again, my name is Lolita Johnson. I'm one of the lead four counselors here at the, Davis, at the National Davidson County Sheriff's Office. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our eligibility criteria. Um, I know some people talk about some of the barriers, and this can kind of be a barrier for us being that it is a jail and a lot of the offenders that we work with do not stay in our facilities longer than maybe a year and sometimes much shorter than that. But in our criteria, we have individuals that are not currently in application process or pending, which, which you all probably know, and also they cannot have, a, um, they must have at least 120 days before being released from jail. We also only want people with a severe and persistent mental illness or have experienced homelessness. And they have to be currently working with our psychiatrist in the jail and taking medication there. So a lot of times we have a lot of people that may apply or get a referral in with the case manager that have not seen anyone, not doing anything. So we have to kind of work with the case managers to you know, let them understand. And we have been fortunate enough to be able to work with the case, case managers, sit down with the staff and let them know what we're looking for. And we also are able to go into the facility and talk to the offenders and let them know kind of what we're looking for. So we've been very fortunate with that. Um, another thing that's been cool with the criteria is that we also work with mental health courts here in Davidson County and they make referrals as well. So it's not just 
to case managers, we can get referrals from mental health court as well as uh, the public defender's office and a lot of outside agencies that may have had someone that they were getting ready to work with, they will also make referrals to us and it's been very helpful because we're able to catch people that may have been on the outside that were trying to get the services but were not able to and then they were incarcerated. So we were able to help them. So that was very helpful. Next, our technology piece. Um, we thought this was important because like Mr. Malloy stated, we have been very fortunate to have our mental health people inside the facility. So we have access to IRMA, which is the Electronic Records Management Assessment. And what this means is I'm, me and uh, my coworker, which I forgot to mention, her name is Angela Claiborne. She's actually not with us um, today. She's in training. She, we have access to the medical records, to the mental health records of everyone in our facility. So we were able to get that access. So we can kind of see if they've seen the doctors, what's been going on and everything. So it makes it very easy for us. And we also get access to the outside records that may have already come in that the doctors have requested. So we have a lot of stuff already on hand that we don't have to request sometimes from the other agencies um, for the medical records. So that's been very, very helpful. And this is also where we keep our progress notes to document that, you know, we've seen the person, we're able to upload the records there, and it's been very helpful. Also, the jail management system, which is uh, the sheriff's office system, this is where all our referrals are made. This is where we also put the information to show when we actually start working with the offender all the way to the point of the person being approved. And so we can keep a timeline of when we started the process to when they were approved, and we can put in our system and keep a good track record of how long it took, as well as um, when the person is getting out of the facility as well. So this is very helpful for us. It's our timeline, I guess you could say. This part, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Malloy and let him kind of talk about some of the statistics for you. What we've tried to do in the last few years is track the number of individuals who have been approved for the SOAR program and um, have benefits and released. And of individuals that we were tracking who met those criteria, there was about 40, about 42 actually. And we looked at their total number of arrests, which was really close to about 500 arrests, 460 or so. And what we found is those are very low level arrests, um, nu nuisance mainly charges. And one year prior to the SOAR program being approved, on average, the people were arrested three times um, on average each year. And there's a little misnomer, I think. Sometimes in a high-risk population, what we see when we track other programs, a lot of people view recidivism as people never coming back into the system. And unfortunately, that's usually not the case. If, if a person has been involved in the criminal justice system for several years, they've built um, kind of a lifestyle that there's a lot of components that need to be fixed before they stay out of the system. Um, and their potential to come back to the system, unfortunately, is pretty high. Especially with the SOAR population, this is probably one of our uh, most critical and highest uh, return groups that we deal with on a regular basis. But this gives you a little bit of a feel for a one year prior to arrest before the SOAR program was initiated. And then one year post uh, initiated. And if you look, you got 94 of the individuals that were approved. They were arrested about 94 times one year prior to the program. And then after release, that same number of individuals was re released 80, um, arrested 85 times. And a lot of times you'll look at that and say, well, 85 is not much different than 94. Um, but in actuality, they're, they've, they've been arrested one or two less times the year after than the year prior to the SOAR program, except you know, one individual, he kind of blew, <laughs> blew the chart numbers off. But as you look at these two charts, it's, it's obvious that some of them are doing really well. And they're not re-entering the system. And for the most part, these individuals have been involved in the criminal justice system for at least five to eight years. So the reduction is, is pretty 
significant, especially for the ones who have not returned in a year. When we're, we were looking at some of the training around um, why individuals come back and how we can have a better impact on the ones who come back into booking. So we did a couple things that were really relative for what we needed to do. First, all the SOAR candidates that we've applied and been approved by the Social Security Administration, we put in our system. If they do come back to jail, they're flagged as a SOAR participant. So we can re-engage those individuals and find out what has happened um, and why they're back into the system. And one of the main reasons we see is a transportation issue. Um, our jails, a uh, large portion of our jails are out uh, probably about 10 miles from downtown and the Social Security Administration from that facility site is about 15 miles away. So what we've asked a lot of the individuals that we've re-engaged who have come back into the system is that they weren't able to get to the Social Security Administration to begin the benefits that they had been approved for. So for us, that was a, a really good training piece and education that transportation and identification for the individuals who have already been approved for benefits, we needed to address. And that's currently still an issue for us that we're trying to address currently. So I do want to add, Paul, go can ahead, I add, go Paul, uh, this sure, is Lolita. I wanted to tell you one of our success stories. So I, we did have a gentleman and it just kind of shows how our program works when Paul talked about our transition from jail to community. One thing that we have been fortunate with, not only do we have the relationship with um, DDS and Social Security, but we also have been fortunate enough to be able to get Social Security cards for our offenders, that this population. So we had a gentleman that actually went through the SOAR program, but not only that, he was able to get housing, we were able to get bus passes for him, we were able to get his Social Security cards and kind of get him into everything. And he has not been back to jail since since he actually applied and everything's been going really well. I actually speak with his case manager on the outside and because, again, the relationship with mental health cooperatives that who we work with, they kind of keep in contact and he's doing really well. And, you know, those are the successes that we really are proud of. And like Paul spoke about earlier about the one guy that's kind of off the charts, you know, you're always going to have a few that come back, but the catch is that we do get flagged when we see that and we're able to try to connect with that person to get them right back out or to see what we can do to make sure they don't lose their benefits and see what we can do to help them in any way possible. I mean, we do everything to even making sure the discharge planner, make sure they have enough meds, just everything. We try to make sure we hit every avenue to, um, you know, get those barriers out of the way the best we can. So just something I kind of wanted to add in there because I think that's important to talk about the successes. A lot of times, you know, we don't get to hear those, but yeah, just wanted to add that. And let me, let me just follow up in, in closing on that, that for us, the major effort for us here in Nashville is the transition from jail to community. And the SOAR program is a very good fit for what we do here. Um, when we apply someone for benefits, we also look at all the other criminogenic needs that they have. If they're, if they're undereducated, if they're, they need housing, if they need transportation, if they need a food box or they need clothing, um, we have a social network site called Basecamp that we communicate internally with all of our community partners on the outside and those other needs are being met as well. So. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. We really try to be as broad as we can when we're looking at all components of reentry. And we think that's what's successful, not just with the SOAR candidates, but also the other individuals that we deal with on the other programming piece. At this time, I, I want to turn it over to Donna Bond and Marcus Ayers. Okay. Um Thank you for inviting us to join in this webinar. Um, first slide. Um, in 2006, the initial uh, planning started 
for this collaborative pro uh, program between the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services and the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. Um, there were a few key like-minded um, folks that were in administrative uh, roles with a common mission, and um, that uh, mission and goal was um, first to decrease uh, the recidivism rate for the inmates with the most serious uh, mental illness. Um, as you know, um, our state is like every state, um, the seriously mentally ill are very overrepresented in um, the prisons and their recidivism rate. Um, since 2006, um, well, I, I want to say in 2006, the planning started. In February of 2007, services started uh, with three integrated services discharge managers in the prisons that have the uh, mental health units and that have the most, the highest number of inmates with serious mental illness. Um, next slide, please. Um, since 2007, we've increased the number of staff trained uh, in SOAR training and training um, with um, case management and just several different um, evidence-based practices and assessments that we use in our program that we've built over the last 11 years. Um, I want to say that since we started in 2007, we've now uh, worked with over a thousand inmates in Oklahoma. Um, and I also want to say that um, our, recidivism, our recidivism right with this group, um, since we started, and we measure this in, in three years intervals, that our last, at last um, check, we were at 22% recidivism. We have cut it right in half from what, uh, with the comparison group. Um, so how we built and this program is that we, uh, built and nurtured relationships with several different agencies like uh, vocational rehab, um, all the local um, social security offices, the um, Department of De uh, Developmental Disabilities, um, the um, Department of uh, Human Services, um, local housing authorities, uh, HUD, which is the Federal Housing Authority, uh, basically anybody and everybody that we could find um, that would join in with us um, for this program and for our mission to um, decrease the recidivism rate and to help get this population approved and on public benefits so they would have a chance to stay in the community. Um, also, since we started, we've um, applied and been awarded four federal reentry grants that have really helped um, go along with our state-funded reentry. Our initial um, program was possible through the funding of Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services to continue to. Uh, provide um, right at a million dollars per year out of their general fund for our state funded programs and our community based contracts that um, people um, transition to from prison to the community. Um, but the grant definitely helped um, because we were able to expand and add a co occurring population, um, so we were at, uh, able to add a second um, population and that their needs were a little bit different, but a lot of these folks also met criteria for disability, so when that was the case, we also uh, made sure that those applications were done as well. Uh, next slide. Um, our go is approval before release, and we want the approval before release both for um, SSI or SSDI if they qualify, as well as um, Medicaid. We want to know that 
um, when the people that we're working with leave, that um, 30 days after the day of release, they should be eligible for that first check. Um, and normally that, that goal is met. We start, we do our Medicaid applications at 30 days pre-release. Um, and we have a specific contact with DHS. Uh, we also have specific contact with our local Social Security offices. So when we call, we are not just talking to um, anyone that answers. We actually have a contact person uh, for each local office. Um, we have a contact person at the um, uh, um, disability Division uh, office. We have the um, general manager there. It has been great to work with us. Uh, if we run into any kind of issues, he's always there to support and help us. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to, can we go right back to the, the previous slide really quickly? I'm sorry. I wanted to mention that when we don't have enough time to complete the entire process uh, before release, it can cause a lot of obstacles, um, you know, with housing, um, with um, just anything that has to do with them sustaining themselves um, in the community, even though we have programs with funds to help people in our programs um, when they first get out, if they don't have this pre-approval for their um, benefits to start shortly, you know, after release or within that month or maybe two at the most, that really puts a strain on our um, team and on our program. So it's very important that we have the right amount of time. And with Oklahoma, but, um, they have built in um, new credits, earned credits, good conduct credits, um, and different things like that within DOC and within Oklahoma to help move inmates through the system faster, which is definitely a good thing that it just makes um, the need for us to plan um, critical. Next slide, please. Um, in establishing the SOAR process, once the online application is done, we make sure that everything's accurate and that we have a complete packet. We fax it to the local office. Um, and the most key component to getting a quick approval and a quick turnaround is that we have a psych summary from the attending psychologist. Um, when we have that to send with the rest of our medical documentation and paperwork on that day, we can get really quick turnaround approval. But that is key. And we have some wonderful psychologists in Oklahoma and Department of Corrections that help us with this. Uh, in fact, when we have our uh, annual um, meetings with the Disability Determination Division, examiners, and all the local SSA office managers, and then all of our staff. Um, our psychologists always receive accolades in just how well they do with their reports and how it really helps uh, the examiners with being able to make a decision. We also have in information sharing agreements in place um, to where if examiners don't see something, in that report or in the paperwork, they can go into our medical records and look for that extra information. Um, we want to provide it for them, and so it makes uh, the process much more um, time efficient for them. But if they do need something else, they can go into the record. Um, we also have information sharing agreements in place uh, between Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services and Department of Corrections. Our collaboration truly is um, uh, one of a kind in Oklahoma, and I've never heard of one exactly 
um, like it where uh, the agencies work so closely together um, and it's just really um, been the key to our success in this. Uh, next, next slide. Um, we just, to follow the SOAR model, uh, again, just allowing time to complete and submit applications within the correct time frame. So planning, um, checking with case managers, checking with your uh, facility records department to make sure that the um, projected release date for an inmate is not going to change, that, you know, their earned credits that may be extra are already worked into that date. So we know um, when they're going to discharge, we don't have any surprises. Um, we have learned um, some really hard lessons with that. We've learned to plan and call and check and double and triple check um, so that we are able to get these, this process done in time. Um, I can say that we have known of uh, one approval that from uh, the day of submission into the local office, from the call back uh, with approval as quick as seven days. Um, next uh, slide. Um, over the past 11 years, our approval rate has um, kind of varied some, but it is at 80%. Um, right now, and um, I think the for the general population in the community, I think the approval rate is um, for first time applications. I was thinking 33, but it might even be lower than that. Um, I I would have to double check on that, but 80%. Um, is uh, I think that we're, we're really proud to have that rate and we have, we have not gone below that. Uh, next slide. Um, we um, got here in our program and with the success that um, I've been talking about by having all of our reentry staff trained. Uh, we started with three staff inside the prisons that are hired and uh, employed by the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. We now have seven and eight with the um, boss or with the supervisor. Um, and mentoring is an important part of the program. Um, we have um, integrated services discharge managers will go on site and work with the new staff, um, and then they'll have the new staff come and work with them. Um, and I'll just give you a example of mentoring. Um, I was one of the first three discharge managers in 2007, and I was at the maximum security prison in McAllister um, doing my very first application after, after my SOAR training. I had a maximum security a uh, seriously mentally ill inmate in a very small office along with the general manager from the local social security office. She came to the facility, went through um, the process to be um, stuck down, to have to go through the um, metal detector, all of that to come in and go through that first application with me, which that's something that I've never forgot um, to have someone, you know, that type of mentoring. So in turn, um, we've, we've always um, provided mentoring for one another and made sure that before a person starts doing these applications on their own that they are ready. Um, and another really important uh, com um, Step to success is that we're consistent with um, our process, that we're consistent with our timelines, we're consistent um, in uh, the way that we um, do our um, paperwork, so, you know, the steps um, 
we make sure that everybody follows the same steps. Uh, an example is, is that we flag uh, each application to say that this is a prisoner free release case. Um, it's very important that that's flagged. If not, it will just go into general cases and no one will know that that's actually an inmate release uh, case. So, you know, that's just one example, but um, this consistency uh, that we are all doing things in the same way and that the staff at the uh, local offices and at the Disability Determination Division office know what to expect from us and know that um, we're all going to be doing things in a consistent way. Um, and just, um, you know, support one another and, um, you know, provide uh, um, anything that they need as far as new staff that come on. And if we run into anything that we can't fix or that we don't know how to do ourselves, uh, we have plenty of support in the local offices and in the state office. Um, so uh, that's been very helpful. Um, next, next slide. Um, I want to ask Marcus if he can think of anything uh, that I didn't say that he feels important to say with our presentation. Uh, I think maybe just one thing that I would add is just highlighting uh, how important this process is in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, the, the population that those seven staff work with in the, in the Department of Corrections are individuals with uh, of every range of mental health functional and um, disability, you know, represented pretty much in the general population. And so in the state of Oklahoma, uh, sometimes the only chance that these individuals have for treatment is to be a part of the Medicaid program, and we're not an expansion state. And so being able to assist these individuals with uh, obtaining disability uh, is really the pathway to get them into sometimes nursing homes, uh, into residential care centers, and then of course into outpatient services as well. So these these uh, services that we provide really make a humongous difference in the lives of these individuals in the full range of what they were talking about a minute ago in terms of housing, treatment, income, those three uh, factors. Uh, I think that wraps up our um, presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Donna and Marcus. Um, before we get to Q&A, which is going to start in just a second, I wanted Dazara where uh, to talk about the slide that you're seeing now about SOAR and CJ technical assistance opportunity that's coming up shortly. Dad, do you want to talk about that for a sec? Absolutely. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is our invitation that has gone out on October 23rd, um, kind of uh, soliciting um, respondents to an RFA that we've presented. Um, and this is just a not just a, but this is a great opportunity to have the SOAR TA Center fully engaged in your effort to implement SOAR in your facility. Um, the technical assistance opportunity provides um, planning and technical planning and technical assistance, um, which includes um, implementation meeting that's on site, uh, where where we could gather all the key stakeholders together um, to. Um, provide a, a, a guided kind of discussion about uh, how SOAR could work in your facility, um, what areas need to be addressed, um, and those sorts of things. Um, an awardee would be provided the opportunity to participate in the Leadership Academy, which would help to provide you with the skills needed to kind of um, understand how to build the infrastructure within your facility. Um, and then uh, once that piece is kind of um, kind of solidified. We'll go ahead and, and, and 
part of that plan address those folks that you've identified to complete the SOAR applications and assist them with online course and um, how to track those outcomes. Um, the application is what you see right now. Uh, it has five, uh, 10 components, um, and it's an, we ask that you could submit the application in narrative form, addressing each of the components, uh, and three and no more than five page applications. Um, we'll have a kickoff call for um, any questions that you have about applying on November 14th, so stay tuned for that announcement. And overall, the applications are due on December 21st, and announcements will be made for at least six kind of um, awardees um, in January. So if you have any additional questions, you can ask on this call, or you are more than welcome to reach out to any of us at the SOAR TA Center. Great. Thanks, Daz. You're welcome. So we have um, some really great questions uh, that have come in, and many are related to how do I um, start a SOAR um, initiative? How do I get started? What are the first steps? And we had a couple questions that came in um, early in the presentation. You know, like, I understand the statistics, but what can SOAR do? And, you know, how do I start a SOAR um, implementation within our criminal justice system? How can I get my SOAR local program uh, to now reach out um, and integrate um, SOAR with the criminal justice system, com uh, system community? So um, I wanted to first remind you that if you're new to SOAR or you've taken the SOAR online course or you're a SOAR local lead, you know, I'll re, uh, just remind you uh, to go to the SOAR website and, again, find your state. You'll find your state lead. You'll find your uh, SOAR local leads, uh, but also your SOAR TA Center liaison who can give you more uh, detailed information about if there is any criminal justice um, coordination within your locality, within your state. That's a great place to start. And then they can loop in Dazra Aware with the TA Center, who you just heard from, about, um, again, a, a efforts that uh, she can help with to, again, establish some of the relationships uh, similar to the presenters today from Nashville and Oklahoma. So, again, hopefully you'll, you'll go there to get uh, more information. Uh, but, again, you can type in some of your questions in the Q&A box that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. If we don't get to your question today, we will um, be sure to get that to one of our panelists and answer that um, offline. Uh, so don't worry. We'll, we'll make sure we get to some of your questions. Some are very specific to clients you're working with. And, again, those we want to make sure we give you the most accurate information. So we may handle these offline uh, as well. Uh, to draw in maybe more expertise from SSA, for example. So an overriding question, we had a, a bunch of these questions, um, again, and this is, I'm going to throw this out to all the panelists. Um, what messaging can, can you share in terms of uh, beginning? How, do, how does somebody start? What are the first steps that um, a SOAR program may need to take to start even thinking about integrating um, in your community, and I know Oklahoma has been doing this for a long time. So, would you want to start, Donna, with sharing what would be the first step to engage um, at the state level? Well, um, kind of as I explained earlier, um, the planning started um, a year or more before we actually started services, and uh, some of the leadership um, persons or in, individuals in leadership roles, um, you know, collaborated um, on this and uh, knew that getting public benefits in place so this uh, population was going to be critical. And I also know that um, when we first started our reentry program, that um, we were part of the Mathematica study. So um, I think that was also, um, you know, I was not one of the key planners of the program. I was one of the first staff 
to work in one of the prisons um, to do the work, but I was not in on the initial planning. Um, I was hired in 2007 to actually start doing the work. So um, I just know that we had multi-agency um, collaboration and that I do know that um, Mathematica uh, was involved and that um, we were hired and were all sent for SOAR training. So I'm sorry. So it, sounded, it, it sounded like it started with training for you. Dad, would you yes. like to chime in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pam. So, uh, you know, I, got, I get a lot of these questions from um, reentry specialists and case managers, are, you know, that work in jails or prisons and really see the need but not really know where to um, start the conversation. So we spend a lot of time talking about statistics and the prevalence and the importance um, of attaching individuals with serious mental illness that are incarcerated is quite clear. I encourage you to do, um, you know, as we discussed when we talked about how to start a SOAR initiative in CJ settings earlier in the presentation, I encourage you to start by gathering information. Gathering information specific to the facility and the community that you work with. Um, as we said, we talked about collaborations and we talked about how important it is to, um, to um, build those communications and those collaborations with the same um, kind of agencies that provide services to the same folks that you provide services to. So as you are gathering information about your facility, how many people are currently incarcerated? How many people are currently incarcerated that are receiving um, um, psychotropic medication? How many, how many people um, of that population have returned back um, to, pris to prison or jail? Attach the cost. Each state has a website specifically for prisons that will tell you how much it costs to house an individual um, that is incarcerated, how much it costs them. Put a number next, I mean, put a dollar amount next to the number so that you can demonstrate the potential amount of money that is spent to care for this individual. Um, so it starts with preparing and identifying the need, but also being able to address it more from uh, the financial aspects of how SOAR can work for the institution. You have two major kind of um, lines of, of communication or two kind of um, areas that you must address when you're talking about implementing a, a new program. You have to speak to the heartstrings of the people that are providing the services because they do want to see things that work. But you also have to speak to the purse strings of the person that has uh, the position of authority so that they understand the importance of um, committing to a program so that they can see the best results. So it starts with gathering information. And I don't want to take a whole bunch of time. There's a whole bunch of things that I, I want to say. Um, but it starts there. And then you prepare a proposal. You identify the need. You identify how SOAR can help, and you talk to people. You talk to the chief jailer, the chief social worker. You go to all of your reentry meetings. You talk to the chief social worker. You talk to, um, you know, the public defender's office. Because, again, all of these folks touch the lives of the same person that you're providing services for. So the more that you talk, the more that you gain the buy-in, which makes your proposal even stronger. And then you use the outcomes that have gained from everywhere else across the country. You, you contact someone from the Source TA Center and say, hey, you know, where can I find statistics on or, or data about the amount of applications that, you, you know, that, you, that have been submitted across the country and what are the outcomes? We'll be happy to provide that for you. Um, and in the meantime, in part of your conversations, not only with the community and within, um, within the, 
you know, in, in your agency internally, you also want to talk with Social Security. Um, but if you're not comfortable there, start just at the beginning and getting all your information together. It's, it's not um, a process where you want it to happen, so you wish it, and then you mention it, and then you never mention it again because they didn't hear me. It's something that you are adamant about and consistent because you really know that access to this kind of benefit really helps the people that you're serving. Great. Thanks, Daz. And I shared some of the tools that the TA Center has, and uh, part of that are some FAQs, um, which will include, I think, hopefully some answers to some of the questions that we have here about getting started. Another question that popped up is, how do we establish a pre-release agreement? Um, how does that start? Um, and or how do we know, how do we find out if our state or our locality has a pre-release agreement? Would like to take that down. Yeah, sure. So um, that's another conversation that needs to happen with um, with you reaching out to the SOAR TA Center to find out if we have any information about your state that you know you just didn't know of. Um, and then if there is no pre-release agreement, um, that starts with communication and conversation with the Social Security field office in your area. And the SOAR TA Center is a great resource. Um, we could have contact information that are already there, um, and we can help join you in those conversations. If, those, um, if there is no pre-release agreement, um, we can work with you to help to establish one. Great. Another question came in um, about, and it's a really great question, and it comes up a lot. Um, it's about working with individuals. Do you, have you worked with individuals who do not have a serious mental illness but have a serious drug disorder? Or do individuals have to suffer, suffer from both an SMI and a substance abuse disorder. And again, I think this question hits on some, you know, misconceptions about working with individuals, um, you know, who, regardless of whether there are justice involved. Um, do we, um, who would like to take that question in terms of, uh, of that? Because we know that an individual can't be found disabled if they only have a substance use disorder diagnosis, right? They need to have um, at least, um, you know, uh, m another medical condition or a mental health disorder. Um, does somebody want to address that issue of, of folks that, I know Dan touched on this, individuals that do have a serious mental illness, substance use disorder? Sure, Pam. The, uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't take the substance use disorder diagnosis at face value. Uh, <laughs> many of the individuals uh, that uh, are coming into to jails really haven't had access to health care. Maybe, maybe they, right. through the emergency system, they're diagnosed as a substance use disorder. But when you start to look, remember the prevalence issues around medical co coexisting medical conditions, trauma, uh, undiagnosed depression, there's a lot of undiagnosed mental illness uh, mm -hmm. that you'll see in, in the population that might look like just substance use disorder. So I wouldn't take the mm -hmm. substance use disorder at face value. Uh, yeah, the other Dan. thing. So go ahead, Dan. Yeah, and, and then the other thing is that um, the, they're, um, to, to get a good history and assessment so that you're getting mm -hmm. the past records from the community that and what you typically find with a lot of individuals is that they'll have multiple diagnoses, which, which really is, so it becomes important to get a good current psychiatric assessment that looks at, at the longitudinal uh, health career of, of, the, of the folks. And remember that even though there might be a lot of substance use disorder, that with health conditions and mental illness can reach the threshold of a disability. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. I think that's a really great point to stress and, and to uh, also review the SOAR online course uh, about this topic, uh, which will give you some more guidance. Um, so with that, we are out of time. Um, you'll see on this slide we have uh, Dazra Ware's email should you want to reach out to her directly. Um, again, I just want to thank all of the presenters for your presentations and on behalf of the SOAR TA Center and the Game Center, 
We'd like to, again, thank our presenters and everyone who joined today's important webinar. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and thanks a lot for joining us.